All right. Uh, let me let me uh, tell you very briefly what we're going to do today. So I, I just want to take a few minutes to uh, wrap up my discussion of uh, uh, the struggle for independence um, in India and the deployment of nonviolence uh, by Gandhi. Uh, then I want to have a little uh, a discussion, a brief discussion of Hind Swaraj, which was uh, one of the principal texts that was uh, given to you for uh, reading. Um, and it's from a very early period of Gandhi's life, but uh, it is generally viewed as one of the seminal texts in the vast corpus of Gandhi's uh, writings. Uh, and then from there, I'm going to move on to uh, the end of World War II. So recall that India uh, acquires its independence in 1947. So obviously, the struggle for independence is also going on during the time um, uh, of World War II as well. Uh, and uh, I want to look briefly at uh, the uh, Nuremberg and Tokyo war crimes trials, as they're called, uh, and then from there move on uh, to the subjects for, uh, that is listed for, uh, under the syllabus for today. Uh, we're going to continue with it uh, in my following lecture, and that's the emergence of what you might call the international system, which still largely governs whatever, whatever one makes of the international system, but uh, the system includes obviously uh, institutions such as the United Nations, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, uh, and a great many other organizations. Now, before we get to all of that, 1930 is where, we, where I had stopped my previous lecture. I'd been talking to you about the SALT Satyagraha, the SALT march that Gandhi had undertaken. Uh, and once again, I reiterate this. I uh, will continue to do it. Uh, these details, uh, and, and that's really the case with some other details that you get in other lectures as well, are really for your understanding. You're not really expected to remember any of this, and obviously you don't really have any readings that go into the, into the history of uh, uh, you know, the Indian nationalist movement or other comparable movements. Uh, the important thing to remember is this, really. Uh, if you're trying to understand uh, how, uh, what, was a, what was the nature of uh, you know, the political developments in India post-1930 uh, after the SALT march, is that uh, it's going to be another, another 17 years before India acquires independence. But in the interim period, one fundamental problem develops. And that problem is that uh, the Muslims uh, in India and if you're looking at the population of undivided India, so when I say undivided India, that's before independence in 1947, because independence was accompanied by the creation of a new nation state uh, called Pakistan. And for those of you who've been keeping up with the news for the last two weeks, uh, you know that there's been yet another iteration of the conflict between India and Pakistan, uh, in, this, in this case over Kashmir. That's what they fought over principally. Uh, over the course of the last six, seven decades. Uh, but uh, the, the origins of this, if you want to understand it in this fashion, really go back to the fact that in the 1930s, in the late 1930s, uh, a certain section of Muslims began to demand autonomy. Uh, and if you're looking at the population of undivided India at that time, you're saying the Muslim population is roughly about 25%. Uh, of India's population. And, uh, in 1947, uh, the population would have been uh, in the neighborhood of around 400 million. So we're saying about 100 million Muslims and 300 million uh, Hindus and Sikhs and whatever else. There might have been the ma vast majority, of course, of that 300 million would have been Hindus. Uh, so they begin, so there's, a, there's a demand for autonomy, and this is what is called the two-nation theory, namely the idea that the Hindus and the Muslims constitute separate nations. Uh, uh, and, of course, a supposition uh, that these two nations cannot inhabit the same space and that Muslims, if they were to live in a Hindu majority India after independence, that was a claim advanced by some section of the Muslim political leadership that these Muslims would be discriminated against. Uh, so that's going to lead to uh, uh, the demand for not simply autonomy, but eventually will lead to the demand for a, because you can think of autonomy within the nation state. You can say that, all right, we're going to, we're going to give autonomy to Muslims within India. But no, what the demand is eventually going to lead to is the creation of a new nation state uh, for the Muslims. Uh, now, 1939, when World War II breaks out, 
uh, India, uh, as was the case in World War I, uh, India is going to contribute a large number of soldiers to the war effort. Uh, this is an interesting chapter of the history, but what is more germane for our purposes is that the Indian National Congress, which is a nationalist uh, organization and the largest such nationalist organization in India, indeed in the world, the Indian National Congress says that it's going to actually stay neutral in this conflict. Uh, so one of the arguments that was advanced there was that, well, uh, you know, while we obviously support the British uh, in the fight against fascism, uh, we are also anti-colonialist. That was obviously the position that was going to be adopted by a number of Congress leaders, uh, including uh, Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi is not the only uh, major figure in the Congress, there are a number of other major figures, but, but there is no question that for a period of time, uh, Gandhi and the Congress came to be viewed as nearly synonymous, certainly in the world's imagination. Uh, so, in 19, so in 1942, uh, Gandhi is going to you know, give a, a call, uh, this is going to be called, this is the final call for independence, it's called the Quit India Movement. Right? So August 1942, he basically gives a speech where he says, well, you know, the British should really leave us to ourselves. How we resolve the differences amongst ourselves, that is the Hindus and Muslims and others, this is something for us to decide. We just want you to event evacuate the country, essentially, right? That's what the Quit India Movement is. And the British response is they're going to put Gandhi and all the, all the Congress leaders in jail, uh, and they're not really going to be released uh, for a couple of years. And then, of course, you have the end of World War II, by which time uh, Britain itself is no longer really a world power. Because uh, for those of you who know the course of the war, even though Britain won the war, uh, we know that, we know that uh, uh, large uh, sec uh, sectors of the British economy had been shattered. Uh, many, of, many British cities had been bombed from the air continuously for a substantial period of time. So in 1945, the negotiations for Indian independence are going to begin. Uh, and to cut a long story short, uh, uh, August 15th, August 14th, August 15th is going to be the, what's called the partition of India. So they're going to create a new nation state of Pakistan. Uh, and uh, India is going to emerge as a free country. This is going to be accompanied by uh, uh, bloodshed. Uh, it's estimated that maybe a million people may have been killed. Uh, some people have offered a higher estimate, but that's a reasonable estimate. Uh, in, in what are called, so these are known as what are called the partition killings. Uh, and when I speak of that, in, it might be, might be a little uh, mysterious to what I'm really referring to. What I'm referring to is what are called communal killings, that is Hindus who are going to kill Muslims, Muslims who are going to kill Hindus, the Sikhs are involved in this as well. Um, and this is because what's going to happen is when they create a new nation state. So if you look here, so this is, this is the partition of India. So this portion that you see here where I'm moving the cursor, what is called West Pakistan, this was all a part of India. This becomes a new country, and this is a real anomaly. Uh, this is, of course, something on which people have written um, hundreds of books, but there is a very large Muslim population over here as well, in the eastern part. So this is, so this is East Pakistan and West Pakistan is one country. It's one country. So these are Muslim-majority provinces, and India is right in the middle. And of course, it's a strange conception of the country because it's bifurcated and India is occupying. You can't draw a map of Pakistan, obviously, without first drawing a map of India. So think of it this way, right? And, and then, of course, if we were to look at this history in greater detail, this portion, which is East Pakistan, is eventually going to gravitate towards independence from West Pakistan and is going to become in 1971 in December 1971, the country of Bangladesh. All right, but, but that's a much, much later history. So these killings I'm talking about is, and you can see from here from the arrows, uh, migration of, so when they draw the line, when they draw the line bifurcating India from Pakistan, there are obviously going to be a large number of Hindus who are going to be left behind in Muslim majority Pakistan, and there are going to be a large number of Muslims who are going to be left behind in Hindu majority India. And so these, these people are going to cross borders. The Muslims are going to go to Pakistan. The Hindus are going to come to India. Many of them left their ancestral lands. They left all their possessions. 
And this is where the killings are going to take place is during this exchange of population. Um, this is the largest migration or exchange of population in history over a period of time. Within six months, 15 million people are going to move uh, across the borders here and across the borders here as well in East Pakistan where you have a similar situation, all right? Um, now, uh, Gandhi was opposed to the partition of India, but uh, be that as it may, what's going to happen is that on 30th January 1948, uh, six months after India attains its independence, uh, he's going to be assassinated. He's going to be assassinated by uh, an Hindu extremist uh, whose position was that Gandhi had betrayed his own fellow uh, Hindus, uh, had, had sided with the Muslims. That was at least the position that he, that he, that he advanced. Uh, he, had, he had a great many other grievances. The assassin had a great many other grievances as well. Uh, for example, his view was that nonviolence was something that was really appropriate to women. It was not a manly thing to do, and that a nation state could not survive in a modern system built on principles of nonviolence. Um, so effectively, you had to do away with the old man. Uh, that's, that's essentially what the assassin is going to say. Um, and sometimes people like myself have referred to this as a permissive assassination permissive, by which I mean that even though it was one man, Nathuram Gotse is the name of the assassin, he's the one who pulls the trigger that accounts for Gandhi's life. But in effect, it was a permissive assassination, meaning that there were hundreds of thousands of people who more or less accepted Gotse's explanation. That is, people who essentially stood for what you might describe as a Hindu uh, nationalist agenda and whose view was that, well, in India should be a Hindu nation because now that the Muslims had their own country, there was really no reason for Muslims to be in India. And if they were going to be in India, they should view themselves as second-class citizens. Right? That was the view of uh, people like the assassin of Gandhi. Now, let's go, back to Gan let's go back to Gandhi. So this text that was assigned to you, uh, this is one of the editions. You're reading it in a different edition. Uh, Hind Swaraj, um, and I want to s talk a little bit about this work because for those of you who read it, and I'm assuming that all of you have or you will have read it, uh, uh, you might have thought to yourself, this book is written by a madman. I mean, he's some kind of lunatic because he seems to have some fundamental problems with doctors and with lawyers and with railways and with modern technology. Uh, what, sort of, what sort of man is this that we're really talking about? Now, this is a treatise he writes in 1909. He writes it in 10 days. Uh, it's in the form of a dialogue between someone called the reader and the editor. One of these is, of course, Gandhi himself. The other one is the imaginary interlocutor. Uh, that is the person who's putting all these difficult questions to him. Uh, you might want to think about a Socratic dialogue. Uh, there are many, many other models we can think about, uh, including... For those of you who are Catholics, you know about what is called the Sunday School Catechism. You know, uh, it, it, it has something of that flavor, but it really also uh, has something of the flavor of, you might say, Socratic dialogues. And as in a Socratic dialogue, if you read The Republic, you know that you get these characters who are posing questions to uh, Socrates, and Socrates really uh, uh, is uh, taking up the bulk of the space there, right, in his explanation of for example, in the Republic, what is justice, what is truth? Uh, the interlocutor is really a straw man, uh, in a way. Right? That's the nature of, this, nature of this text. Now, what does Hind Swaraj mean? It has, it has two meanings. Uh, generally, it is only read, um, generally, only one meaning is, uh, is taken seriously by most people. So Hind is the word here for Hindustan, India. Swa Raj means independence. So the word Swa, uh, the prefix Swa means one's own, Raj means rule. So people who rule themselves. That is, you can, you can view it as an argument for uh, political self-determination. Right? That, that would be the easiest way to read it as an argument for sovereignty, for Indian 
independence if you want, although at this point in time in 1909, Gandhi is not really advocating for independence as such, right? Um, independence from colonial rule. However, that is only the most transparent meaning. It has another meaning, and that meaning is the rule over one's own self. That is, I have to have each individual must exercise sovereignty over themselves. For example, if I don't have control over myself, right? I surrender to my basis desires all the time. You know, I am a glutton. I am a sex maniac. I am this or that. I surrender to all my desires all the time. That means that I don't have any control over myself. And Gandhi's claim here is that there is a relationship between rule over oneself, that is where one learns how to restrain oneself, and rule over oneself in the sense of ruling one's own country. Why should foreigners rule our country? Right? There's a relationship between, between the self-determination that is political and the exercise of control over one's own self, over one's own being. Because for Gandhi, the question is, and it's a question that every thinking Indian asked herself or himself in the late 19th century and moving into the 20th century. And what was that question? How did we as a people, how did we as a country, come under colonial rule? How did we become enslaved? To the British, right? And, and here we're not even moving into variations of this, such as the fact that there were only 100,000 Britishers in India, and there are 300 million Indians. And in 1947, close to 400, right? How, how, did, how did the British establish their sovereignty over us? And of course, there used to be a traditional set of answers. Well, the British were militarily superior, so forth and so on, uh, or that they had a much more advanced economy. Now, you know, we have con considered some of these, these questions before, and we know that none of them really work completely if they work at all. We know that, for example, in, in 1750, India was a considerable factor in the world economy, right? as was China. Even if we discount the figures that I'd given you, even if we say that India did not occupy 20% of the world's GDP, let's say it occupied even 10% of the world's GDP. Right? Well, that's still a considerable portion, if you think of it, right? So what Gandhi is going to argue is that, look, there were, there were, to some extent, our colonization by the British has to do with our weaknesses. We were, we were seduced by the materialism of the West, right? and so on. That's what he's going to do in Hind Swaraj. And then you think to yourself, all right, so I understand that part of the story, but why is there this diatribe against lawyers and doctors? And Gandhi has a great many reasons for advancing arguments against modern medicine, modern system of litigation. And I'll give you one clue. Think of Hind Swaraj. In nearly everything that Gandhi is talking about, he has a critique of what I am going to call the third party. The third party. What do I mean by that? So one of the things that the British often argued, and in fact, it's an argument you can see consistently over a period of 200 years, that, you know, we're in India to keep the peace between all these people who really cannot keep the peace between themselves. Right? We are a transcendent power. We transcend all these differences, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, and then, of course, you know, upper caste, lower caste, that India is a country of myriad divisions. In fact, there is no India other than for the fact that we are here and we provide the unity. So we are, gonna, we, we are the third party, eff effectively. That's not how they're representing themselves. That's how I'm interpreting. We are the third party between the Hindus and the Muslims. 
Now, who are lawyers? Lawyers are the third party between two parties that have a conflict with each other. Now, that makes sense if you think about it. Right? That's typically what a lawyer does. A lawyer comes in between two parties that have a conflict. And Gandhi's submission is not only that the lawyer is really only interested in his own self-aggrandizement, that the lawyer is not fundamentally interested in the clients. He's only interested in advancing his wealth. Right? And certainly, if I see the modern American legal system or other modern legal systems, I'm inclined to believe that. But let's supposing that you said, oh, well, you know, there are benign lawyers and so forth and so on. That's not the point. The point very simply is this, that Gandhi is claiming that essentially the only resolution, the only substantive permanent resolution to conflicts is when parties deal with each other directly. And this is something we may have to think about when we're looking at the conflict over Kashmir, which is going on as I speak. The last 10, 15 days, it's been chaotic in that part of the world. Right? And of course, there's always a temptation to say, well, maybe the US should intervene, maybe the Soviet Union, Russia, maybe China. And then you think to yourself, all right, so how about doctors? And what's Gandhi's submission here? Gandhi is saying that the vast majority of medical problems begin when you fail to understand your body. So, you know, tonight, let's say I go back home, I've had a long day, and then I go on a binge of drinking. And two o'clock at night, I wake up, want to throw up or go to medic, my, you know, the little medicine chest in the bathroom and take out Alka-Seltzer or Tums or something. I failed to exercise control over my body. And that's why I have to do all of that. Now, Gandhi's submission is that modern medicine is fundamentally the third party between you and your body. And this is what his fundamental critique is going to be. Now, of course, I'm giving you two in, in really segments because there is a vast epistemological critique in, in Hind Swaraj about the nature of modernity. What, what is it that we call industrial modernity? Right? And how do we think about the relationship between humans to their environment? There isn't a word about climate change here, by the way, of course, because no one was thinking about climate change. But if you read some of the passages that were assigned to you, I mean, it's extraordinary because what Gandhi is really saying is that fundamentally the modern system is based on an exploitative relationship between humans and nature. Right? It's built on that. And that is his critique of industrial modernity, and he's suggesting that this is, of course, central also to the whole question of colonialism. So then what does Hind Swaraj become? It then becomes an argument for how we have to emancipate ourselves. It's not simply an argument for political self-determination, but it's an argument against industrial modernity. It's a critique of colonialism. And fundamentally, it's a plea that the only basis for a fundamental reorganization of human society is the commitment to ahimsa, non-violence. That only change that is channeled through principled non-violence can, in fact, actually work. But there are a great many very lofty arguments here, because if you turn to the back of this, one of the most astonishing things that you find is that in an appendix here, what does he do? He gives you the list of authorities. Authorities meaning he says that these are texts that you can read which will help you understand my argument. Now many people have viewed Hind Swaraj as a diatribe against the modern West, right? But, but when you look at the list of authorities, you find that 90% of them are Western authors. And they include people like Tolstoy. Uh, you, I hope you recall my discussion of Tolstoy. I'm not talking about Tolstoy the novelist. I mean, it's the same man, of course, but I'm talking about the Tolstoy who, who is the author of these great but, uh, novels, War and Peace, Anna Karenina. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the Tolstoy who wrote the book called The Kingdom of God is Within You. 
what is, what is Gandhi doing here? And this is really my last point before I move on to the next segment of my lecture here. My, my point here is this, that Gandhi's argument in Hind Swaraj is also this, that freedom is indivisible. Namely, that you cannot be free if there are others who are not free. You may not be aware of that. You have to be brought to an awareness of that. So therefore, the political project is not simply emancipating India from British rule. It is emancipating the British from their own worst tendencies. And I want you to recall the argument I have given you consistently in this course, that before the English brutalized India or Africa, they brutalized their own women, they brutalized the Scots, the Welsh, the Irish, the working class. Right? What, what Gandhi is saying is that it, it's, it's like, and that's, if you go back to that book by Lindquist, Exterminate All the Brutes, you know there are these little segments when he's talking about Africa and then suddenly he starts talking about himself in a personal vein. And there's this little episode where he talks about, for example, him being beaten up by his father. And you think to yourself, well, what's the relationship? The relationship is precisely this, that, there, that those forms of violence are not unrelated to the forms of violence that nation states inflict upon their own people and upon other nation states. There's a fundamental relationship here. Brutalization takes many forms, you know, right? And so... This is also a treatise on the nature of freedom. That freedom is indivisible and that India needs to strive for independence from colonial rule, but in this struggle it should do it so in such a dignified fashion, which is only possible through nonviolence. It should do so in such a fashion that the British themselves become reformed. Right? That's what Hind Swaraj is about. Fundamentally. I'm giving it you in a very capsule form, but I've tried to encapsulate the major arguments that are really present in this extraordinary text, which, as I said, if you just read at a, you know, straight through without really reflecting to and pausing to think about what he's doing, it's going to sound like a very odd text. And it's going to sound like a text, as I said, written by a man who has some fundamental grievance you know, about the modern world. So you think of him as some grouchy old person uh, who doesn't really make sense. But there is, there is a philosophical, epistemological, and political argument in this text. Now, 1945, World War II comes to an end. First, of course, in Europe, <coughs> excuse me, and then, of course, in the Pacific, some months later. There is what is called the Yalta Conference, uh, where Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill are going to get together to determine the future of the world that is going to emerge. And of course, some months following the Yalta Conference, you have the nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which I'm going to consider in, in greater detail later on, when we look at a whole segment having to do with technology, including nuclear energy. The Americans are going to insist upon the unconditional surrender of Japan. <coughs> this is one of the things, <coughs> excuse me, this is one of the things that's going to precipitate the um, atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki because in order to procure this unconditional surrender, the Americans argued they had to bomb Hiroshima and then three days later they had to bomb Nagasaki. And you have these trials which are going to take place, what are called the war crime trials in Nuremberg and Tokyo. Now, I do want to dwell on these war trials for a bit because you could argue that the modern legal system, particularly the modern legal system having to do with international law and the adjudication of war crimes, emerges in good measure <coughs> 
from what happened in Nuremberg and Tokyo. So the first set of trials takes place in Nuremberg in Germany. Um, as is quite obvious from the fact that they take place in Germany, they are intended to put on trial German war criminals. <coughs> um, there are a number of things that are really quite singular about the Nuremberg trials. Let me first give you some, some facts about these trials. Okay. The first is that there are four countries on the side of the Allies who constitute what is called an international military tribunal. <clears throat> the United States, the Soviet Union, Britain, and France. Now, these trials are going to put as you might think of them as a showcase trial if you want to think of it this way. Uh, what they're going to do is they're going to put the word on notice that you cannot conduct war crimes and hope to get away with it. Okay. But, that, but the matter is a little more complicated. It's a little more complicated because when these trials were launched, at that time, a cold war between the US and the Soviet Union had already commenced. <clears throat> now, because this Cold War had commenced, nearly everything the United States did, and when I say the US, I mean the US and its allies, but it is principally the US, because you have to remember that Britain was destroyed at the end of the war to a substantial extent. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have to get a drink of water. I'll be back in a second. Okay, so uh, when I'm speaking about the Cold War ser serving as the backdrop, anything that is transpiring at this time has to be viewed as a kind of a message being sent by the Americans to the Soviet Union. Uh, this is particularly true of the atomic bombings. The Nuremberg context is a little bit different because the Soviet Union was part of the military tribunal. So there are four countries, the US, as I said, USSR, Britain, and France. Uh, France had not played a major part uh, in the war because France had fallen very early on. You know, there was a resistance movement, of course, within France. Uh, but, but France did not really play the kind of role that obviously Britain and the US, and then subsequently the USSR played in the war. So the question is, what did Nuremberg seek to establish? And what it sought to establish was the question of responsibility. Very simply, <clears throat> the argument that a number of German war criminals made was, we were following orders. We were following orders. And at Nuremberg, what the prosecutors sought to establish was that you cannot evade responsibility, that there is a chain of command, and the responsibility goes not just up, it goes down the chain of command too. Right? Because if you said it only goes, the responsibility only goes up the chain of command, then you say that, well, Hitler and Himmler and Goring and Goebbels, you know, you, t you take the Fuhrer and then you take the people who are just below him and maybe another layer or two, and then you say, well, that's where the responsibility stops. <clears throat> 
But of course, at the, on the other hand, you couldn't put thousands of Nazis on trial. And one of the reasons you couldn't put thousands of Nazis on trial was because since the Cold War had started, the United States was very clear in its mind that it needed Germany as an ally against the Soviet Union. And of course, that's one of the reasons why the United States instituted what is called the Marshall Plan, right? So if you, uh, if you look at this over here, the Marshall Plan, 13 billion US dollars, the largest recipients are Britain, France, and West Germany. And mind you, there was no comparable Marshall Plan for Japan. Of course, Japan is gonna come under American occupation at the end of the war, right? So the supreme commander of the Allied forces was General MacArthur, and General MacArthur is going to be ruling Japan. That's the period of occupation, which is going to last for several years. But there's no comparable Marshall Plan for, for Japan. But for Europe, there is, because it was understood by the United States that you had to rebuild these countries because these countries were going to be the bulwark against the expansion of communism in Europe itself. Right? So when we're looking at Nuremberg, what we're looking at is a complex set of circumstances where on the one hand they establish a legal principle that there is this question of responsibility and this question of responsibility cannot be dodged by the war criminals. On the other hand, the Americans felt constrained and how many people they could really punish. So what you're going to find is that there's going to be a very small number of people who are actually going to suffer. It's very small number of Nazi war criminals are going to suffer. The vast majority of Nazis who were complicit in the project, not simply of the Holocaust, but in launching the war and creating obviously what is going to become a world disaster, the vast majority of these Nazis are going to get away completely free, with no consequences for themselves at all. Now in the Pacific, after the end of the war against Japan, they launched what were called the Tokyo War Crime Trials. So these are not as well known as the Nuremberg Trials. They're also very different in some fundamental respects. They're, they're, one of the fundamental respects in which they're different is that in Nuremberg you have four judges each of them representing the four major countries on the Allied side, the US, the Soviet Union, Britain, and France. In the case of the Tokyo war crime trials, you had the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, as it's called, was comprised of 11 judges from 11 countries. So one, country, one judge from each of these 11 countries. One of the 11 countries that was represented was India. And India was represented because in the Pacific, especially in the Pacific zone, Indians had fought in the war. Right? You know, the Japanese had, were descending upon India. There was a campaigns in Northeast India and in Burma. And that's where you had the engagement of Indian troops with the Japanese over a period of time. So it was decided that India would be allowed to send one representative. But here is the little anomaly that you have to think about. That these trials are going to commence in late 1945. And at that point, India is under colonial rule itself. So it's the British government of India that's actually going to appoint a judge. They appoint this man called Justice Radha Binod Pal, who is a judge of the High Court of Calcutta. This trial lasts for two and a half years. I mean, it's monumental in its proceedings. And at the end of the trial, Justice Radha Binod Pal issued an 800 page dissenting judgment where he found all the Japanese war criminals not guilty. Of all the charges leveled against them, they were still going to be executed because you did not need a unanimous decision in order to send a person to the electric chair. Right? So eventually, the majority is going to find them guilty, 
of the charges, but Radha Binod Pal is going to issue a dissenting statement. And th this is an extraordinary statement. And why does, what is the basis of his dissent? His basis of his dissent is basically twofold. We can segment each of these into various arguments, when I'm, but I have to really summarize it very briefly for you so you have some understanding of why he is dissenting. The first argument is that the very countries which are trying the Japanese for war crimes are themselves guilty of war crimes. That is, the Americans, the British, the French. And what Radha Binod Thal does is he spends 100 pages enumerating all the atrocities committed by the Americans, the British, and the French, and others in their quest for colonial adventures. He also asks, why is it that the United States is not being put on trial for crimes committed against humanity when they did the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So this is what is sometimes called, and again I reiterate, I'm really simplifying, but this is what is sometimes called victor's justice. There are shades of that, there are shades of that. But I have to tell you, by the way, that people like Churchill and Roosevelt recognized and Churchill wrote about this on a number of occasions. He said that if we had lost the war, there is no question that the Germans would have put us on trial for war crimes. Right? And of course, you had incidents such as the bombing of Dresden. So you know, Dresden was this great cultural center and the Americans reduced it to rubble, absolute rubble. You had the firebombing of Tokyo long before the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk about that when I talk about Hiroshima, that a large number of Japanese cities had been completely reduced to rubble. He also says, and that's his second argument, rather be not Pal's argument, that some of these charges, such as crimes of aggression, he says that this actually is not a crime under international law as it now exists. Okay, so what he's saying is that the allied powers have come up with what are known as ex post facto arguments. Ex post, ex post facto is Latin for after the fact. Right? And the easiest way to understand is, let's supposing I get charged with a crime. For example, I get charged with a crime in 1940 of sexual harassment. But this particular crime does not exist on the law books in 1940. And if I'm applying it retroactively, this is called an ex post facto, after the fact. So one of the critiques of Radha Binod Pal, so he's saying that some of these charges against the Japanese war criminals are actually crimes which are not recognized as crimes when they were committed under international law. And then you can think to yourself that maybe one critique we might have of Radha Binod Pal is that he has a very positivist conception of law. That, yes, maybe there was no crime called wars of aggression, but clearly there were related kinds of understandings. That, for example, there are conventions which have guided conduct between nations when they go to war going back to 1600. Going back to 1600. Right? Just like on the battlefield, in ancient times, there were certain protocols that were always observed between warriors. You do not shoot a person in the back, for example. Give you a very simple illustration. 
I, and that's something that comes up even today. You know, that's when you read the news report of a young black man who's been shot. And particularly if he's been shot in the back, you say, well, there's been some violation by the police here as well. So this positive, when I say positivist conception, what I mean is that this is a very technical, you could argue. I'm not here to, at this point, really look at all the nuances of it, obviously. But you could argue that he had a very positivist conception of the law. And he's not really looking at the spirit of the law. But even if we took this position, we're still going to have to deal with some of the other criticism that he has in his judgment. All right? So that was basically what the Tokyo war crime trials were. And what the trials in Nuremberg and Tokyo did was they sought to establish a new international system, particularly with respect to questions of war crimes, crimes of aggression, crimes against humanity, crimes against peace. And you know that in recent years, they eventually came forward with what is called the International Criminal Court of Justice. And some of you may be familiar with it. The unfortunate thing is that the United States is not a signatory to it. And one of the reasons the United States is not a signatory to the International Criminal Court is because the US argues that its own laws are going to supersede any international law on this question, nor does it want American politicians who might be arrested in a foreign country and then be taken to the International Criminal Court of Justice. For example, there are left-wing activists who have argued that George W. Bush should be tried for war crimes. Right? So the US is not a signatory to the International Criminal Court. And it's one of the few countries, along with what are called so-called rogue nations. And that's a very interesting thing, that many of the international agreements to which the US is not a signatory, the other countries which usually are not a signatory to such agreements, are what the countries that the US describes as so-called rogue nations. Okay? And that includes, obviously, countries such as Iran, Cuba, North Korea, and so on. Right? So that's part of the politics of this. Uh, it's also a very interesting thing that the International Criminal Court of Justice, that the prosecutions that have taken place in the last 10, 15 years have almost entirely been of African political leaders. There are one or two exceptions. One of them is Milosevic, you know, from the Balkans. But most of the prosecutions that have taken place have been of African politicians and dictators. And of course, the one reason for that is that these are the people who are the most vulnerable in the international system. Now, in the aftermath of the war, an international system emerges. And you have a conference at Breton Woods. Breton Woods is in New Hampshire. And this is what puts into place the, the, basically the economic system that in some form or the other still exists today. Obviously, things have changed. But such as, for example, the World Bank. And the World Bank is an organization which is part of the United Nations. And what it does is it gives loans for capital projects. All right? So large-scale development projects, mainly in the third world. And then you have the International Monetary Fund, uh, known the IMF in short. The US contributes 17% of the world's, 17% the of the budget of the IMF. And the IMF is, base, IMF is a complementary organization, international organization that basically regulates international finance, international cash payments, right, monetary supplies, all of those kinds of things. That's the difference between, they also give out loans uh, but loans for capital projects are usually given out by the World Bank. So you have the World Bank, and then you have the International Monetary Fund. And then one of the, one of the things that came up in the aftermath of the war was what is called GATT, which is a general agreement on tariffs and trade, which, which was put into place in 1947, and in 1994 is simply superseded by what is called the WTO, the World Trade Organization. So what does the World Trade Organization do? Just as a very simple illustration, and I'll end with that, one of the things the World Trade Organization does is if there is, for example, a dispute between two countries, as there is at the moment between China and the United States on tariffs, or let's say that China is dump 